to another episode of NC Beer Buzz. I'm Glenn. This is Dave behind the camera. We're the NC Beer Guys. And we're here with Green Man Brewery, head brewer, John Stewart. John, appreciate you having us in today. Thanks for coming by, Glenn. Good. And we want to talk a little about Green Man, the evolution, how John came to be with Green Man. So let's start there, and then we're going to move over later to see the other side of the facility. We're happy in the new part of the Green Man operation. And the expansion was about a year ago. We said we started operating on the new side. That's correct. And we'll kind of go in a different direction then. How did the uh, expansion increase your production capacity? What was the idea about the need for the expansion? Well, the main reason for the expansion was uh, distribution. But uh, going all the way back uh, to the history of the beginnings of Green Man, uh, Green Man was founded in uh, the Jack of the Wood pub, which is right up the street from us here, and in 1997. At that time, it was considered just a brew pub, mm -hmm. and it was a very popular brew pub, did really well, but in 2004, the owner at the time decided that he wanted the brewing operation to move down here to Buxton Avenue, which is where we are, okay. and actually the building next door, um, which you'll see. Um, is actually that, 23 Buxton. Correct, okay. right? That's, that's where the tasting room is. That was the production facility from 2004 until last year. Mm -hmm. um, in 2009, the brewery was purchased from the Jack of the Wood people by Dennis Thies. And Dennis is a long time um, beer distribution guy. He's, uh, he's been in beer all of his life. And the current and, owner still. Of the and the current owner, owner still, that's are. correct, yes. Yeah, I came in 2007, and so during the whole buyout, I just transitioned, transitioned over, over, over to the new ownership. But um, one thing that Dennis wanted was to get bigger. And, and we're uh, bigger. And we're plenty bigger. The old brew house uh, was a 10 barrel size, and uh, this brew house over here is a 30 barrel size. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten considerably uh, bigger. We have uh, six uh, 60 barrel fermentation tanks. Uh, we've upgraded uh, our filtration capacity. We added a bottling line over here, so we're much better equipped to be able to distribute our products. Made. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, did that also mean new products, or we're still mostly with the flagships that we've known for some years, the Green Man products? Well, by all means, the flagships are the focus, but by all means, we are expanding our line. Okay. One of the really neat things about expanding production over here to this side is that allows us to do a lot of uh, neat specialty products on the other side. Oh, back on the old system, the smaller That's system. Correct. It's like That's almost correct. a small yeah. batch operation now. Exactly. One-offs yeah. and specialties. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Really good. Absolutely. Um, my assistant brewer, who mm -hmm. was with me uh, from the time that I came on board here, Mike Karnowski, uh, he took over as the head specialty brewer of the small okay. facility over there. So you kind of like work this building inside yeah. and he yeah. kind of has his meeting exactly. over there, right? Exactly. And so Mike does all the uh, interesting specialty products. The specialties, the seasonals, like the Harvester and the Forester, which is the stout that's about to come up, uh, Rambler, which is in the spring, and Wayfair. Those are done over here because those are released in 12 ounce bottles. Because of the capacity with the production Absolutely. demand. Yeah. That. that and the fact that the bottling line, you know, while it is small, it's not really that portable. Right. So anything that's going to be bottled in large quantity mm -hmm. uh, has to happen over here. Now we're very familiar with Green Man in Raleigh. It's, it's something we've always been available mm -hmm. and have it over to us. Is the distribution pretty much statewide? Pretty much statewide. We're not out on the Outer Banks, okay. But uh, we're as far down as uh, Wilmington, right? Um, Eastwise, uh, we go all the way uh, west as far as Bryson City. So that's pretty much the whole state. And here. is that a function of being one of the so-called grandfathers in the movement? I mean, you guys have been to craft beer. You know, you are one of the groundbreakers in North Carolina. Is it just because we've been around so long and people, when they first came to craft beer, you were, because a lot of the new breweries don't do distribution that widely. Well, you know, um, distribution is a goal. And so I think that anything that you you put your focus on, mm -hmm. um, you can achieve right. in a relatively short amount of time. Um, there's a lot of trend in the industry now towards smaller, and uh, and more confined just, and just serving the local community. Exactly, we find that exactly. in a lot of breweries. Yeah, they don't have the goal. I mean, you said it was a goal, 
but it's not everybody's goal. Some of these smaller guys that are coming up, it appears that they just want to serve the local community or a couple of counties or one sure. city. Sure. But that's not and, a Green Man mission at all. Well, there, those kind of operations are great, and then there's a lot of merit to that. But one of our focuses is we want to send our beer to people who really appreciate mm -hmm. our beer. And if those people happen to be on the other side of the state, All right. well, you know, we need to get our beer. And do we cross state lines? I don't really know. Do we go South we, Carolina? We, to current, we, we currently go to Tennessee. Okay. Um, we w will be going to South Carolina, just in the Greenville area, mm -hmm. uh, sometime in the next few months. All right. Great. So, Good. That's so uh, we're going to step over a little bit into the other side, but just a minute on your personal background. You came to Beer Brewer, how? <laughs> um, well, as many, I started as a, as an amateur home brewer. Uh, I home brewed my first batch in 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't very serious about it um, for a few years. In 1985, I actually was in a in a financial situation where I could accumulate the the stuff uh, right. that uh, home brewers need to in order to really do it right to really uh -huh. advance the craft. Yeah. And plus, I was in the right place at the right time. I'm a native of Dallas, Texas. Okay. And there was a small microbrewery in Dallas in the early 80s. And I met those people, and they allowed me to uh, to hang out and, and, and learn and, and grow. Learn and, and work for free. So that was your internship free. or apprenticeship, you whatever you want that. to call that. You right? might say that. Um, I was really fortunate uh, to know uh, some of the pioneers um, in the industry. Um, Dr. George Fix was a member of my homebrew club, okay. and he uh, he became a personal friend of mine, um, and he taught me an enormous amount. He was uh, in the midst of writing principles of brewing science mm -hmm. uh, at the when time you it, when you were with him. Yeah, All right. and um, then uh, I got a job actually at another startup micro, which as startups come and go, mm -hmm. this one came and went. Okay. But that allowed me on the inside to uh, to be able to and to brew in a bigger system. To brew on a bigger system, to. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you just grew and grew and came here. And well, I, I joined a brew pub chain mm -hmm. in the '90s, and so I worked my way um, across Florida and Georgia and South Carolina, uh, working with a brew pub chain. I ended up in Atlanta. I brewed a number of years in Atlanta uh, for this brew pub. And uh, then in 2007, when uh, I felt like I really wanted to get to the mountains, All right. okay. um, then uh, I came up here and answered an ad to, uh, to right. come up here. Somewhere along the line, I guess it was the mid-90s, I had a gap in employment and I was able to go to the Siebel Institute. And kind of polish your, your, yeah. your, root, your, your early skills and mm -hmm. become the professional that you are. Exactly. Right. Good. Exactly. We're going to step over to the other side here in a little bit and see uh, what else Green Man has to offer us. Um, so now we want to talk about the beer. Okay. The interesting stuff for some of our viewers. And particularly for those who are not familiar with the Green Man product, the flagships are IPA, ESB, and the Porter. Okay. And these are what you're... Our viewers are most likely to find out and about. That's that right. Okay. Yeah, these are the ones on draft and bottle. On draft this is and mostly bottles. what we're going to see. This in. is what's going to have the widest distribution of all of our products. So if you're on the eastern side of the state, this is what you. We've actually been on the eastern side of the state uh, for a number of years now. So they they're definitely already available. Mm -hmm. It's just. But one of these sell drastically better than the other? How does the bust break down roughly? You know, it's been interesting. Um, for a long time, the IPA was uh, considered our number one flagship beer. Mm -hmm. But as we move a little bit farther away and get a little bit uh, bigger distribution, we find that the ESB is actually creeping right up. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. That, that surprises me. Yeah. I thought with the IPA movement and the hop heads, you know, the IPA you know, was still that, that is true, but the ESB is uh, is a very approachable product. It's uh, it's very balanced, so it's a... And it's also different profile. enough that some people are going to try it for the first time and like it and keep coming back to it. And everybody doesn't like an ESB. You know, everybody doesn't drink yeah. bitters or even know bitters. Right. So that, that right. may be. There is a little bit of education that goes along with a traditional English style. But we didn't talk about it on the other side, but that's something we find everywhere with craft brew. When you go into an area, you've always got to introduce the so-called 
non-craft beer drinker who is a beer drinker and enjoys his beer and thinks he knows beer uh, to the craft products, what would you consider the gateway or the entry point beer for Green Man? Well, these two products, uh, you can do that pretty much. Uh, hoppy products these days um, are so widespread that I think that people really understand mm -hmm. right away. One of the things that uh, was actually Dennis's idea is really good. We put uh, um, descriptors, single word descriptors, uh, on all the bottle labels here that people just instantly recognize. Okay, not fancy and, beer terminology, yeah, well, but just. Okay. Well, that one says hoppy. Okay, so there you I'm go. Right. So if you if you already know what that means, mm -hmm. and if you've been around the craft brew. Uh, seen for a little bit, then that's certainly the difference between hoppy and malty is right. something you and already and understand. And, and, right. and the ESB says malty on it. Um, Porter says robust because it is actually a very, it's one of the fullest flavored beers that mm -hmm. we have. Uh, and if they don't get it out, right, that's right. Yeah. Great. So people can make a decision, you know, based upon that, you know, right away. Um, the ESB is, is well, it's my favorite product. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to uh, put any one of them over right, the other because right. I love them all. But, but uh, you got a personal fight. Uh, uh, I, right. I, I like to plug the ESB there sure. just, just a little bit. So what are some of the like the, the more non-standards we might not well, see available everywhere? Right here we have the Forester. The Forester is our winter stout. And um, you know the Forester is in the tank right now. So it should be released in the next couple of weeks. And this is an annual you've done for some time? This is an annual we've done for some time. Okay. Yes, indeed. And this is this is a, the first release in bottles. You know, we did it for the last couple of years in a row. On draft. On draft okay. only. And so this, so, again, so viewers, this is the first time you'll be able to get the, this Forrester product that's in correct. bottles that's for correct. the season. And, and we think it'll be on the shelves in the next couple of weeks. We sure hope so. Okay, great. Right. It all depends on the distribution well, channel. That's right. right. But that's when we're we're planning on releasing it. So if you miss it before Christmas, you can still drink oh, in January, it'll February. Be, it'll it's, it's, be it's still winter. That's right. Yeah, it'll, it'll certainly winter. be out for Christmas. Okay. But, uh, and actually, this is the second of uh, of our seasonal line that we produced in bottles. The Harvester all right. uh, was the first one, which was our fall beer. Mm -hmm. Now we've already moved through the, the right. Harvester because of the fall season, but. Uh, so we're planning on one of these per season. So after the Forester will be the Rambler. Spring. The Rambler Spring, that's correct. And then the Wayfarer. Okay. Okay, and the Wayfarer we've actually already released, we released last year on draft. And uh, then this coming in 14, it'll be uh, in bottles. I think we had the Wayfarer somewhere along the way last summer maybe. And what about the Bombers? Ah, <laughs> let's see what we have here. This is the Holly King. The Holly King is uh, one of uh, our small batch series. The uh, the Dweller, the Dweller Imperial Stout, um, should be hitting stores really soon. Uh, we just bottled it last week, and uh, it's ready to go. The Dweller is our one of our oldest seasonals. Um, it it's I love Imperial Stouts. I have since uh, the late '80s. My mm -hmm. first. Uh, came across Imperial Stout. So in 2009, as kind of a way to commemorate Dennis buying the brewery and, uh, you know, us doing starting, something new. Yeah, and doing something new. Um, I decided to uh, <clears throat> to do an Imperial Stout and uh, he came up with the name The Dweller. And so uh, we've actually done this, this one as a specialty for the longest. Uh, this is the Maceo. And the Maceo is our first maybe second foray into sour beers. And sour beers are a, a whole new genre. Of, but coming uh, on strong. Lots of people are really yeah, into their sour beers. Really it's, uh, it's a new category. Well, it's, it's actually not a new category if you really understand the history. Right. But it, it certainly is to American craft brew drinkers. Um, and, and sours are very interesting products. This one is a, a brown ale base um, soured in red wine barrels, okay, and then we add um, uh, cherries, both Bing and sweet cherries, right. to the barrels, and so it has a little bit of a cherry note to it. This is the second time that we've done it. The, fir could, the first could. time was pretty, 
my uh, compatriot behind the camera is lusting for that, I can tell already. He loves the flavor in the beer. So he'll have some of that for sure. So. Maceo, Maceo is one of uh, probably my favorite of our uh, sour, right? sour lineup. And um, Salisbury, if you're uh, if you're a Willy Wonka fan, mm -hmm. I think you probably understand the meaning behind yeah. uh, the top hat on the Green uh -huh. Man and the term Salisbury. Yeah, um, it's such a blend of so many different uh, fruits. It's it's. It's soured in the same way as the Maceo, in the barrel. and that was a base beer uh -huh. fermented, soured in the barrels, and then we added fruit to it. Okay. And uh, Mike just put so many different fruits on it, we just we just had no idea what to call it. And it just comes out in a balance. Uh -huh. uh, there's, there's not anything predominant over right, the other. Right, there's, there's raspberry and, and other, all sorts of different fruits. There's like four different fruits in it. Right. And, uh, now, what's the availability like if I go into a regular bottle shop? Or is that where I'm going to find these? No, I'm not going to find these in the, the draft. The Dweller, um, you will find the Dweller in limited draft and you'll find it here. Okay. Um, I mean, here in the... Here, right, right here in the tap room. You'll oh, find so all okay. of these right uh, here in the tap room. Absolutely. Exactly. Right uh, now, it's all other places. Well, the Dweller, because we've done it for so many so long now. I mean, this is like our third year right. of uh, doing the development. We did it over uh, on the big system. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So, so we it have, is, it is out and about. We yeah. have quite a bit more. Um, but we won't find some of these others in the wild. Particularly the wild uh, beers because we only own about 20 or so wooden barrels. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, most brewers that do barrel aged products, we source our barrels from wineries and uh, if we do a bourbon barrel, kind of, which we have a bourbon barrel aged uh, version of the Dweller, which the barrels earlier, mm -hmm. when we were over at the other right. side there, those are okay. those are the bourbon barrel aged version of the Dweller. But we don't have a lot of barrels. So, so the production is fairly yeah, limited. It's fairly limited. So yeah. for our viewers, if you want to drink something that all your drinking buddies have not had, uh, <laughs> make your way to Asheville and to Green Man and particularly pick up some of these products that you just won't find every day on every show. We appreciate you being with us today. It's Thanks great to see Green Man doing so well and to hear and learn all about the beer. Uh, until next time, this is the NC Beer Guys with another episode of the NC Beer Buzz. Uh, remember, drink local and keep your beer dollars in North Carolina.